Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. This program is brought to you by the support of our Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net whose support makes this summer series possible and who voted for this particular series, The Summer of Angela Lansbury. Today's program brings us to the Hallmark Playhouse and the original air date on today's program, October the 5th, 1952. And the title is Mansfield Park. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark Cards bring you Angela Lansbury in Mansfield Park on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories and presents as your host one of the most distinguished actors of the American theater, Mr. Lionel Barry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight on Hallmark Playhouse, we bring you a story by one of the great women novelists in, the, in world literature, Jane Austen. You know, Jane Austen wrote her first two novels before she was 22, but it was several years before she found a publisher who would take a chance on her first novel, Pride and Prejudice. As a matter of fact, while she did enjoy a certain popularity in her lifetime, it wasn't until after her death that Jane Austen achieved her position among the greats in the world of literature. One of the novels which helped her attain this position is Mansfield Park, which we're dramatizing on Hallmark Playhouse. And to star in this story, we've chosen Angela Lansbury. And now, here's Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, let the hallmark on the back be your guide. For that hallmark tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical Because You're Mine, starring Mario Lanza, Doretta Morrow, and James Whitmore. And now here's the first act of Mansfield Park, starring Angela Lansbury. story of some ladies of another century, of a rather unpleasant lady, Mrs. Norris, and a rather excitable one, Lady Bertram. Several other assorted ladies and gentlemen that you'll meet shortly, but first a glimpse of the two ladies just mentioned. Dear sister, we must do something about our poor sister, Mrs. Price, but what can we do? Francis would elope with that lieutenant of the Marines. And what's done is done. But Mariah, they're so poor. And all those children. The very least we can do is help with one of the children. Why don't you invite one of Francis's girls to live with you? Why don't you invite one to live with you? Well, if I were married to a baronet as you are, I wouldn't hesitate a moment to do my Christian duty. I'll tell you that. Oh, well, I'll speak to Thomas about it. 
And so, under those circumstances, when Fanny Price was ten years old, she came to live at Mansfield Hall. I remember as though it were yesterday, my first glimpse of Mansfield Hall. I looked out of the carriage window through tears of homesickness at sweeping lawns and tall, friendly trees. I stepped out into a world of sunshine and blue skies and summer-laden air. And there before me was the house, proud and splendid, English from her regal columns to her proper turrets. I remember my aunt, Lady Bertram, bending down with a kind smile. Good afternoon, Fanny. I hope you had a pleasant journey and that you'll be very happy with us. I remember my second aunt, Mrs. Norris, looking down at me from a very great disapproving height. Well, Frances certainly didn't pick a very pretty one to send, did she? She's all eyes and bones. I remember my uncle, Sir Thomas, the most frightening man I'd ever seen in my whole life. Well, now. You'll be a good girl, mind your place and mind your manners. <laughs> You'll be all right. I remember wondering whether I'd ever be able to find a dark corner where I could cry and finally finding it and being found there. So here you are, Cousin Fanny. Now, you mustn't hide away like this. Come, take my hand. I'll show you around the grounds. Oh, you're a little homesick now, but that won't last. Come on, now. I'm your Cousin Edmund. He held out his hand. I was ten years old. But when I put my hand in Edmund's and rose to my feet, I was in love for then and for always. But I never told, and no one guessed. In all the years that I was growing up, no one once guessed. To me, only one man existed in the world, and that was Edmund. But to Edmund, I was a sister. Fanny, what are you doing out here in the garden by yourself? I didn't realize you were alone. Where are the girls? Oh, Julia and Mariah are riding with their bow. Oh, I see. Fanny, isn't it time you had a bow? Oh, I don't know. I, I really haven't thought much about it. I, I don't think I have much attraction for the opposite sex, Edmund. Oh, nonsense. You're a very pretty girl, Fanny. I'm afraid you're just a little too shy and reserved. You must have a little more confidence. You mustn't run away the way you do when people come to call on Julia and Mariah. What else would you suggest that I do, Edmund? I'm not Julia or Mariah's equal. I have no place in the drawing room as an equal. I am the daughter of a lieutenant in the Marines, living in an attic room on charity. Who has made you feel like that? It isn't that anyone has made me feel any particular way, Edmund. It's just that I'm well acquainted with my circumstances. Oh, circumstances be hanged. Oh, don't think that I'm not grateful for all that has been done for me, Edmund. I guess I'm just a little bit lonely. After living here, I could never return to the world I was taken from. And I have no real world here. I'm kind of betwixt and between. Nonsense. You belong to the world you're living in right now. And I insist that you take more of a part in it. Now, we'll start this very night. Henry Crawford and his sister are coming to call. I want to see you in the drawing room. Oh, no, Edmund, now, both really. Both Julia and Mariah have set their caps for Henry. And you shall have your chance, too. Oh, but I don't want to set my cap for him. I don't want to set my cap for anyone. Well, if you don't, you'll be an old maid. Well, I'd rather be an old maid than... Than what, Fanny? Than marry somebody I don't love. But how do you know you don't love him? You haven't even met him yet. Oh, merciful heavens. Look how late it's getting. I have a dozen chores to do before dinner. <laughs> All right. I'll let you escape this time. But following dinner, I expect to see you in the parlor. And so... Because Edmund wished it, following dinner, I was in the parlor. I met Henry Crawford. My dear Miss Price, this is an unexpected pleasure. I have no idea there was still another beauty here at Mansfield Park. I met Henry Crawford, and I met his sister, Mary. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Miss Price. I shall remember that evening as long as I live. It seemed a thousand years ago, and I'm sure I aged a thousand years watching Edmund bend towards Mary. Come take my arm, Miss Crawford. I'll show you the gardens. I'd like that. It's a divine evening, isn't it? I do adore an evening like this. That's a fine-looking woman, isn't it, Fanny? Oh, Sir Thomas, I, I didn't realize that you were close by. You know, I don't think I've ever seen Edmund so taken with anyone before. No, nor have I. Well, it's high time Edmund married. Married? But he only met Miss Crawford tonight. <laughs> My dear, when you've lived as long as I have, you learn to recognize the symptoms at a very early stage. Married. Edmund. Uh, Miss Price, I... 
Oh, forgive me, Sir Thomas. I was about to ask Miss Price to take a turn in the garden with me. Oh, by all means. Forgive me, Mr. Crawford. I, I was just going to my room. I have a dreadful headache. Good night. Good night, Sir Thomas. Oh, good night, my dear. Well, Mr. Crawford, why don't you take Julia or Maria for a turn in the garden? Their health seems to be up to the occasion. Uh, yes, Sir Thomas. At once, sir. <laughs> yes, you get to recognize the symptoms. Henry Crawford got to me a perfectly dreadful nuisance. It seemed to me that every place I turned, he suddenly appeared. Uh, Miss Price, without a doubt, you are the most beautiful woman in England. One glance from you and my fate was sealed. I kneel at your feet. I did everything I could to discourage him. But Henry seemed to thrive on opposition. He absolutely refused to take no for an answer. Fanny, I have quite a compliment for you. Yes, Sir Thomas. Young Henry Crawford has done you the honor of requesting your hand in marriage. <laughs> I don't mind telling you that Julia and Maria are having their little pangs over it, but uh, it's you he wants and will have. Sir Thomas, I appreciate the honor Mr. Crawford is paying me, but I must, with your permission, of course, respectfully decline. Decline? Did you say decline, my dear? Yes, sir. Well, now, Fanny, I don't want to seem unreasonable, but may I ask why you are making such an unreasonable response? I don't love him. Oh, now, Fanny. Young Crawford comes of good family and has substantial means. He's an excellent match. No, oh, I'm going to leave you alone to reconsider. And when you have reconsidered, you come to my study and tell me. Oh, dear. Well, Fanny, I've just heard the good news about Henry. There isn't any good news, Edmund. Hasn't Father told you yet? Yes, he's told me, but but I hardly look upon it as good news. Why not? Well, I... I well, I, I'm afraid I'm in love with someone else, Edmund. Really? Who? I can't tell you that. Is it someone who loves you? No. Is it someone I might talk to for you? No. I'm sorry. For a little while, I thought something was about to happen that would bring us even closer together. You did? Yes. Fanny, no one knows this yet, but you and I have always been so close. You should be the first to know. I've asked Miss Crawford's permission to pay my respects to her father, and she has consented. Oh, I see. Well, uh, congratulations, Edmund. I trust that the answer will be what you hope, and that you will be very happy. Yes, but what of you, Fanny? I didn't realize that you were in love. Is there no chance for poor Henry at all? Are you positive? Quite positive, Edmund. But, Fanny... Edmund! Edmund! But that's Mary. We'll talk again about this, Fanny. He ran outside to Mary, and I watched him take her hand and go on down the hill. I turned my back on the blinding pain of that moment and, and ran as fast as I could back to the house, back to the shelter of Mansfield Park. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Mansfield Park, starring Angela Lansbury. Are you familiar with the stirring paintings of the Four Freedoms by Norman Rockwell and his portrayals of American life as they appear on magazine covers throughout the year? Well, if you are, here's something good to know. This year, the makers of Hallmark Cards bring you a bigger-than-ever collection of Christmas cards by Norman Rockwell. You'll see familiar paintings among them, like the Jolly Postman or the Choir Boy Surrounded by Angels. And you'll see new designs, too, all faithfully reproduced in glowing colors. Best of all, there are several ways to make your Norman Rockwell selections. Choose your favorite design from the Norman Rockwell Christmas cards in the Hallmark Gallery Artist Album and have your name imprinted. Then there's a handy box assortment of 12 at just $1, or 25 cards all alike from the big group of Hallmark Gold Band Boxes. And from the counter display at your favorite store, you can choose individual cards by Norman Rockwell. Those special ones you'll want to send to special names on your list. And always the hallmark on the back of every card you send will tell your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to Lionel Barrymore in the second act of Mansfield Park, starring Angela Lansbury. <laughs> This is 
the story of some ladies of another century. A Fanny Price who could not be untrue to a man who did not know she loved him. Of Lady Bertram who couldn't understand. And Mrs. Norris who didn't even try to understand. Why, why Henry Crawford can't possibly prefer Fanny to Julia or Mariah. The, the boy's either bewitched, blind, or, or coming down with something. Well, whatever's happened to Henry, Julia and Mariah are in tears because he doesn't want them, and Fanny's in tears because he does want her. <laughs> it's conscience troubling her. Huh? It was very underhanded of Fanny to start a flirtation right under our very eyes. Well... What do you intend to do about it? I don't know what I can do about it. Fanny says she's quite resolved to become a spinster. What a miserable spring and summer that was. My cousins Julia and Mariah had never been too close to me at best. And now that great oaf of a Henry was making things worse. Julia soon gave up moping and started a flirtation with someone else. But Mariah still moped. And so did Henry. I was constantly being reproached for that, particularly by Henry's sister, Mary. Henry really is quite distraught about you, Fanny. Edmund and I are most concerned. But have you and Edmund reached an understanding? Well, we have been talking. But I'm afraid Edmund's going to have to get this nonsense about becoming a clergyman out of his head. But Edmund's always wanted to become a clergyman. Edmund must show me a little consideration. Surely he can see how impossible it would be for me to become the wife of a clergyman. And after all, Edmund does come from a family of position and money. There's no need for him... Is that any reason why he shouldn't follow the dictates of his conscience? I should think you'd be proud of him for feeling the way he does. I think I'm a bit more practical than Edmund, my dear. And perhaps more practical than you, too. Or perhaps it's just that I'm not quite as much in love. Don't look so startled. Do you think I don't know? It was there in your eyes the night I met Edmund. For anyone to see? For any woman to see. You'd better accept Henry, Fanny, because you're not going to get Edmund. Your brother's waiting in the carriage, Mary. <sighs> Thank you, Lady Bertram. I was engaged in such an interesting conversation with Fanny, I forgot Henry was waiting. But then I was speaking in Henry's interest. Good day. Good day. Good day. Oh, she's such a lovely girl, isn't she, Fanny? I do hope she and Edmund make a match of it. And I must say she's eager for you to marry Henry. She talked about it all through tea. Aunt Mariah, you've been very kind to me. And I do not wish to displease you. But I cannot, cannot, cannot marry Henry. Oh, very well. Then we'll drop the subject. For today. <laughs> Mariah has a piece of news. She's become engaged to Mr. Rushworth. I'm glad she's decided to forget about Henry. You know, she was beginning to be quite a bore about it. Oh, I'm very glad. Is she happy? She seems to be. He's given her a beautiful ring. So, Mariah is settled. Julia soon will be. And if, if we could only persuade you to think about Henry, I'd have all my girls well taken care of. Mother well, Fanny doesn't love Henry. Oh, love is such an incidental emotion, Edmund. It really has very little to do with marriage. Now, do talk to Fanny. Henry's ideal for her. What is your ideal, Fanny? You Describe him to me. You might recognize him. If I do, I'll keep your secret. He's the kindest man that ever lived. He is strongest of purpose and the noblest of character. Is he handsome? Oh, more handsome than he knows. Is he bright? He is brilliant. Does he realize how you feel about him? No. Then he's a man of a blind fool. Tell me who he is. All he has to do is be made aware of you. If he is all you say, then all he need do is look into your eyes and see all that lies there for him. Who is he? He has looked into my eyes, Edmund. He has looked and turned away without even realizing. Why won't you let me go to him? He's already betrothed to another. Fanny, you aren't in love with Mr. Rushworth. Oh, no, Edmund. I'm not in love with Mr. Rushworth. Oh, thank heavens for that. <laughs> Poor Mariah was unhappy enough to lose out with Henry. I wouldn't like to see you take another bow from her. Henry says you'll never marry now. Do you believe him? Don't you? Of course not. Don't you believe in constancy, Fanny? Yes, of course, Edmund. I just don't believe in Henry's constancy. So 
so, since I didn't believe in Henry's constancy, I wasn't a bit surprised with certain events that took place a few weeks later. I was in the library when suddenly the door opened and my Aunt Lady Bertram stood there. Oh, 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 I'm going to have the vapors. I'm going to lose control every moment. Dear Aunt, what is wrong? Oh, what's wrong indeed, may you ask? What's wrong? Where's Edmund? Where's Sir Thomas? Where's Julia? Where's my sister? Oh, how long must I be in this state before they come to me? My dear, my dear, you must control yourself. You can be heard all over Mansfield Park. I want to be heard all over Mansfield Park. Mother, what's wrong? Read this note and you'll see what's wrong. Mariah's wedding set for next Sunday. The guests invited, the house full of presents, all the preparations made. And there isn't going to be any wedding. Mariah has eloped with Henry Crawford. I don't believe it. Well, well, well that's ridiculous. Henry has asked for Fanny's hand. No gentleman of honor would ask for one hand and then run off with another. Well, Henry's done it. Poor Fanny, after the man swore to forego marriage completely. Forgive me for entering unannounced, Lady Bertram. Mary! I just found a note from Henry. Oh, and I found one from Mariah. Then they've gone. There's no stopping them. Why should anyone stop them if they're happy? This is all your fault, Fanny. If you'd married Henry, he wouldn't have run off like this mm. and disgraced us all. Mary... I don't think it's fair to make Fanny responsible. Oh, don't you? Well, none of this need have happened if Fanny had given Henry half the attention he deserved instead of spending all her time pining over you. Oh, pining over me? Over Edmund? Oh, my word. This is getting confused, isn't it? Oh, Mary, how could you? How could you? Uh, Fanny, wait. Wait. <laughs> Here you are. I've been hunting from one end of Mansfield Park to the other for you. Oh, go away. I have been a blind fool. I never spoke a truer word in my life. Oh, Edmund, don't make fun of me. But on the other hand, how could I know? I could hardly recognize myself from the description you gave me. And incidentally, among the many inaccuracies of that description was one very big inaccuracy. I am not betrothed. You, you're not but... But, but you and Mary... Mary told me that she could not be happy with a clergyman. And once I heard that, it became quite apparent that I could never be happy with Mary. Oh, I, I didn't know. And then, that day you told me about the man you're in love with. I found myself thinking, I wish I were that man. Oh, why didn't you tell me? I saw no reason. You were distressed enough about Henry being in love with you. I thought a declaration from me would only add to your distress. Oh, Edmund. Edmund, darling. What's Edmund doing, sister? He's kissing her. Kissing her? Well, he has no right to kiss her. He must first request her hand from her guardian. And even before that, he should acquaint his father with his intentions. But you're Fanny's guardian, and Edmund's father, and you know all about it. Well, even so, there are certain formalities to be observed. Oh, Thomas, it's such a hot day. Can't we dispense with the formalities for one? Uh, well, to all appearances, Fanny and Edmund have dispensed with them. And so at last, Edmund held out his arms to me. And life was as I had dreamed it would be many years before, when I entered the gates of Mansfield Park for the first time. I had a world of my own now, and my own particular place in that world. Edmund entered the clergy, and he and I were married. And when Edmund in time was sent to the parsonage nearby, it seemed to us that life had given us every possible happiness. And now... Whenever I pass through the gates of the old estate, I remember all that happened to me there and how my prayers were answered and my dreams fulfilled at Mansfield Park.
I will return in a moment. If you were to ask the average American about his childhood memories of Christmas, I think he'd be likely to say, uh, in my family, we visited our grandmother on the farm for a big turkey dinner and all the trimmings. Yes, to many of us, Christmas means home on the farm with friends and loved ones gathered round. And that's why the makers of Hallmark Cards bring you the quaint country scenes of one of the New England's famous painters. Perhaps you already know the works of Grandma Moses, her frosty white fields and big red barns and children scampering through the snow. If you don't, you owe it to yourself to see them soon, wherever Hallmark Cards are sold. You'll find that you can buy Grandma Moses' designs in the same convenient ways as the Norman Rockwell cards we talked about earlier. You can choose your favorite from the Hallmark Gallery Artist album and have your name imprinted, or a boxed assortment of 12 cards at just $1, or 25 cards all alike in a Hallmark gold band box. And from the display racks, you can select individual cards by Grandma Moses, too, for specific names on your list. And there's one thing you can count on. The Hallmark on the back of all your Christmas cards means you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is Lionel Barrymore. That was a great performance, Angela Lindbergh. Thank you for being with us tonight. I enjoy being here, Mr. Barrymore. I always like to be invited to Hallmark Playhouse. You know, Angela, along about here, when I chat with the star of our show, I usually find out what's new with them and then tell them what's coming up on Hallmark Playhouse in, in the future. But tonight, I have something that I want to say direct to all the folks listening. Well, that sounds fine, Mr. Barrymore. What is it? Well, for a number of weeks now, Frank Goss has been reminding us to register so that we'll all be able to vote in the coming elections. Americans everywhere are cooperating in this drive, and I'm very happy and very proud to be able to report to you that we have received word today that the employees of Hallmark Cards have attained 100% registration. Now, this means that each and every Hallmark employee eligible to vote has now registered and will be ready to carry out the duties of citizenship by voting in the November election. Registration is still open in some states. If you live in one and are not now registered, Don't you think you should see to it? Hmm? Tomorrow, maybe? Well, I think that sounds simply wonderful, Mr. Barrymore. My congratulations to the employees of Hallmark Cards. For we all know the whole world is looking to America to prove that democracy works. Uh Uh-uh, that's certainly true, Angela. Next week on Hallmark Playhouse, we're going to bring you the story of the youth of a man who is one of the great influences of his time. The story of the molding of one of the world's most distinguished statesmen, young Mr. Disraeli, by Ellsworth Thane. And in the title role, we are happy to have as our guest Joseph Cotton. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Sunday. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The role of Edmund was played by Whitfield Connor, with Ellen Morgan as Mary, Norma Varden as Lady Bertram, Rachel Royce as Mrs. Norris, Joseph Kearns as Thomas, and Ben Wright as Henry. Every Sunday, Hallmark Cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. On radio, the Hallmark Playhouse with host Lionel Barrymore, and on television, outstanding dramatic entertainment on the Hallmark Television Theater. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Joseph Cotton in Ellsworth Thane's Young Mr. Disraeli, and the week following, Sir Walter Scott's Lady of the Lake, starring Joan Fontaine, and the week after that, Fletcher Pratt's Pebbles Boys on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome back. Well, an engaging story, although unlike the uh, NBC University theater uh, version of... uh, 
Prod and Prejudiced, I felt that there was a lot more I was missing from this story, particularly how much got covered by exposition. But what we did get was actually really good, and I only wish that it had been an hour. Of course, Hallmark is still known for its ties to family entertainment, and and actually profits uh, through it with the Hallmark Channel and DVD sales and such. It's always interesting to see how that branding has changed very little through the years uh, in terms of how Hallmark does business. Though obviously there have been some modernizations, but the core remains very much the same, which I don't know how many brands are able to say over the course of 60-some years. The idea of getting everyone at Hallmark registered to vote, I don't know any corporation that would set out to do that today or be able to achieve it. It does speak to the times and the type of society where being patriotic and being uh, very civically engaged uh, was very good business. And I also have to say that those card designs they advertised sounded great and probably cost a good bit of change on eBay if you can find them unfilled out. All right, well, that will actually do it for today. We have one more week to go in our summer of Angela Lansbury, and you won't want to miss it. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.